how many times have you had a conversation with somebody where you felt that they were not only disagreeing with you, but they were essentially invalidating your entire reality? And how many times have you ever spoken with somebody where you were so sure that you were correct about something, but you were actually imposing your reality onto somebody else? In today's episode of The Intentional Clinician, I'm going to be talking with Joelle Prevost, a licensed clinical social worker from British Columbia. She is the author of The Conversation Guide, How to Skillfully Communicate, Set Boundaries, and Be Understood. She writes, most of us have everyday conversations with ease, yet we can get tripped up when the topic turns serious or emotional. We may fumble or freeze. We may fear saying the wrong words, making things worse, or just getting stuck in an endless argument cycle. Fortunately, there are viable steps we can take to improve how we speak to others. In her book, The Conversation Guide, she teaches 10 skills for making all types of conversations less stressful, easier, and more effective. So today on The Intentional Clinician, we're going to be speaking about her book, her journey to writing her book, how the book has changed her, and how her clinical practice has informed the book. We're also going to talk about other books uh, uh, related to boundaries and communication, and I really think you're going to enjoy the overall conversation. And if you're enjoying the Intentional Clinician podcast, please give us a rating on iTunes or share the show with somebody you know. I'd surely appreciate it. All right, and now let's get to the interview with Joelle Prevost. Welcoming to the Intentional Clinician Podcast, Joelle Prevost. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So uh, as we know, this podcast today is all about your book, The Conversation Guide, How to Skillfully Communicate, Set Boundaries, and Be Understood. So I'm really hoping that uh, hopefully we can model healthy communication during this podcast. (laughs) I hope so. Yeah, that's a good, good goal. Excellent. So, I mean, I'm just going to come right out with it. I love this quote uh, that you uh, sent me, which is, through my work as a counselor, I've been able to boil down almost all miscommunications to either having your reality invalidated or imposing your reality onto someone else. And I was wondering if you could just maybe talk about that for a moment. Definitely. Yeah. So through my work as a registered clinical counselor up here in British Columbia, Canada. I work with individuals. I work with couples. uh, I hear about, or I see in real time, people having conflict, arguments, miscommunications. And definitely, I, I feel like it's something that I call defensive realities coming up, where I talk about this in the book. It's, you know, we all have our, our perspectives on things. We all have the reality we live in. The way we interpret the world around us has been shaped by a lifetime of experiences, all of our belief systems about ourselves and the world. And so we can be in the exact same situation as someone yet have a very different perspective or or reality kind of happening. And, and they're both valid. They're both right. And the example I use in the book that I've, you know, heard other kind of psychology people use the same comparison is that that meme of that dress that was, you know, many years ago where people either see it as black and blue or they see it as gold and white. And so no one's right or wrong. I mean, we know that the dress's real color is black and blue, but the photo of the dress, what color is the photo of the dress? Well, Mm. it depends on who you ask. So I see the photo as black and blue. I don't know if you remember that meme. Do you? I don't, but I remember one where they would say, uh, is this a picture of an old lady uh, yeah. witch in the forest or a young maiden? And I remember seeing uh, the old witch first and it was supposed to be some sort of test. And then you look at it from a different perspective yeah. and you see this like young person walking. <laughs> Definitely. That's a great one as well. And there's uh, tons of cool ones. You can go on the internet. There's some audio ones, there's other visual ones. And so you know, if I, let's just for the example's sake, then say you, you disagree with me and you see the dress is gold and white. If I were to come to you and say, well, the dress is black and blue. The first thing you would probably do is come in and defend your perspective, your reality, say, no, it's not, it's gold and white. So that's what happens a lot of the time is like, 
well, you did or said this. And the other person will say, no, I didn't. And now they're going to argue about what happened and whose perspective is correct rather than attending to what is actually the issue, which is probably someone's feelings are hurt or there needs to be some change or solutions found in some form or another. And so a lot of the time we get caught up in this defensive realities where we're either imposing the way that we've, we see things on someone else, like the dress is this color, like you did this, you said this, you made me feel X, Y, and Z, or, you know, them coming and doing the same thing of like, well, no, I didn't. And then, so again, you're defending. So there's the imposition and defense that just kind of go back and forth, back and forth. And a lot of the times I see people get exhausted and just give in exhausted and just give up the conversation. And then guess what happens? The exact same cycle <laughs> because no solutions were found. No feelings, hurt feelings were attended to. No one felt like they were understood or heard. And this just can build all sorts of things long-term that I see, in, especially in couples, like a lot of feelings of resentment and feelings of, of being alone. And again, just not understood in those moments. So yeah, it can it can be pretty rough to be caught in that cycle of kind of the defense of realities. Yes, uh, and there's many reasons why people, when the conversation derails, so to speak, will all of a sudden move into a defensive mode. And like you said, mm -hmm. it could be examples from their childhood. It could be that mm -hmm. they feel offended that you're not understanding their point of view. Mm -hmm. And it could be most likely that we're missing the entire boat, which is that we're both offended and we have to be able to work on our feelings rather than the facts. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, you've grown up in Western society, um, our culture seems to be more heavy on facts and what is fact versus fiction versus mm -hmm. um, how do people feel about a certain thing. Yet at the same time, uh, we see that if you look at, um, there's like these big debates between sociologists and economists where the economists are saying, well, people are only moving in their best interest. They're only, you know, uh, acting in their best interests. Uh, but if you actually look at human behavior as a whole, you see that people have babies. That's not really economically viable. People do all sorts of things for emotional reasons, right? They buy things they don't need. Um, uh, all these sort of things. So emotions are really running the show a lot of the time, but we in our Western culture believe that we knowing the right thing is, seems to be very important. And thus, if you're in a couple or a friendship or in a work relationship, being right or being the one that is correct seems to be some, a bit of a, uh, a false idol, which can cause major rifts, mm -hmm. which could easily be, uh, fixed if we could communicate. So, um, I do think that yeah. our culture definitely keeps couples therapists in business and, uh, <laughs> conflict mediation lawyers and therapists. And, um, nowadays, you know, when, when you hear about people that have difficulty communicating, you actually hear the word toxic, you know, they're toxic. They will not bend or, uh, you know, uh, come to a resolution with you, um, with others. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that is a huge deal. So maybe could we deconstruct a little bit just for the audience about why do people want to hang on to their perspective? I mean, I just threw my, one of my theories in the hat. I'm sure there's multiple, but what are, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's really interesting just to touch on something that you were saying before of like these kind of quote unquote toxic behaviors and these people of wanting to prove themselves right. That's one thing that I really uh, outline in the book and with my clients when I'm working on these, these kind of communication skills coaching is that having realistic goals for your interactions is so important and is basically step one. That's before we even talk to someone or around them. Are my goals realistic here? Is my goal to change someone else's mind? Well, that's not a realistic goal at all because we can't control other people. I always tell my clients, if we could control other people, I'd be out of a job a hundred percent. So we need to keep in mind 
what we can control and what are realistic goals. And so I've broken those down in my book into three kind of different categories of like a realistic goal could be to try and understand the other person, give them a chance to describe what's going on for them and, and work to understand them. That's a, that's a realistic goal because you can you can control that on your own end by like trying your hardest. Of course, maybe there's things in the way that you can't fully understand them, but you can have the goal to try to understand them, give them some space to to talk. Another one is to describe how you're feeling again with the intent to be understood, but we can't force other people to understand us. So definitely keeping an eye on, on those goals of like, okay, my intent is to describe, or my, my goal is to describe with the intent to be understood. And then other goals, as far as like coming up with solutions and compromises moving forwards. And we, again, can't control people to do stuff, but we can have the goal of, hey, let's try and at least brainstorm some things to try and see how they work. And so thinking about these realistic goals, I think is really important because yeah, so many people are just like, that's what debating is. You know, that's not real life type conversations. Um, so if the goal is to try and like prove someone wrong or change their mind, that's, that's probably not an interaction that's going to go very well. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I think that you're talking about, you know, in having goals, it's almost like you have to work on the setup and the framing and you mm -hmm. have to have permission to do any of this. Because if you don't find out if that person is okay to try for your goal or if they're uh, ready for that, then we're not only not understanding each other, we're coming from two different viewpoints of what the goal of the conversation is. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh if I can throw my little second theory in here about uh, trauma, trauma informed therapies and how the brain reacts mm. to stress. So we know that as hyper uh, arousal or as um, the autonomic nervous system perceives more and more stress, oftentimes it can move into a fight, flight, freeze, fawn response mm -hmm. out of more of a social connected uh, state of being. And mm -hmm. so if that occurs, uh, you know, the autonomic nervous system is, is here for dealing with stress. I mean, it doesn't know the difference really between mental and um, mm -hmm. uh, physical stress. I mean, it, it, the nerve endings do, but your mental reaction may not. And so if you feel yeah. very mentally and emotionally stressed during a conversation, it, your autonomic nervous system can think, okay, we're under threat. Mm -hmm. We need to defend and attack uh, mm -hmm. defend or attack or run away or maybe placate this individual or these, these people here, which can lead to a very unbalanced response, uh, by in the mm -hmm. conversation, because I, I always hear that people kicking themselves say, I wish I would have said this. I wish I would have said that. But in the moment, you know, I freaked mm -hmm. out and got quiet and ran away, or I swore at them and punched, you know, it's like, well, if I could have done it over, well, it's like, well, you can't do it over. Right. And so that's why that maybe the framing and the setup is so important. And I know you have a lot of skills you teach in the book, but um, I'm still, I'm still thinking about the theory about, you know, why does this occur? And um, I don't know why, yeah. do you, why do we have people in our offices thinking that this is only happening to them? You know, they're like, no one understands me. And it's like, well, definitely. And I think we can all relate to that. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. There's, and I, I love talking to clients about this. The urge to defend our own reality is so strong. And I think you've unpacked some great reasons there that I, I definitely agree with. Like the physiological aspects, 100%. Like when our brain switches, it's like the different parts of our brain are, you know, if our prefrontal cortex is switching off and our limbic system is switching on and we're kind of, we don't have access to the problem solving part of the brains that are going to help us, you know, be able to figure out what's the best way to, to kind of maneuver this socially. We're just in like, exactly that reactive instinctual kind of phase. So that's where some like grounding and calming tools I find are, you know, helpful starters to some of these things to, and just emotional regulation tools to help keep yourself in a more, you know, parasympathetic state. Um, so the other thing that I talk about in the book is like, I do a lot of cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. And 
defending our own reality, basically from a CBT perspective, I would say is it's defending our beliefs. And so our life experience is a combination of us picking up different beliefs so that we can make sense of the present and we can predict the future. And without that, we have no way to predict the future, which is very scary for us. So if someone is coming up against our belief system, that is something that we are going to defend no matter what. So we have, like, if you've ever tried to change someone's mind, it's very hard. We all have, you know, confirmation bias and all these other things going on that we just, once we believe something, that's what we believe. And we only like to see evidence that supports those beliefs. And it's a huge part of who we are. And especially these kind of interpersonal beliefs or these beliefs about ourselves. Yeah. Are something that people hold very near and dear, even if they are untrue and maladaptive beliefs. Like we see a lot in, in CBT is like, I'm unlovable. I'm not good enough. I'm unsafe. I'm powerless. These things come up all the time. And so if these types of beliefs are being triggered in some different conversations, that is sometimes I think when people like come in and, you know, get super defensive, there's a lot more going on than just that conversation. Again, from a CBT perspective, some of those beliefs are coming up and that's where having mindfulness of like, what are your automatic thoughts that are coming up to make sense of this situation? And are those even true? Like the big thing in CBT is just because you're having a thought doesn't mean it's true. So if you're using maybe that work example of someone being in their boss's office and their boss is like mad at them for something, maybe their first thought is, I'm not good at, I'm not good at my job. I'm not good enough. Or maybe it's, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to get fired. Or maybe it's like, I'm not worthy of respect. Well, how true are those thoughts actually? But if your brain is using those to make sense of the situation, because maybe you felt that way other times in your life, um, you're probably going to feel pretty awful and like lash out at your boss in kind of a protection mode. I don't know. That's kind of my theory of one of my main theories I go to of like why we defend our realities so and get so defensive. It's like usually there's some bigger stuff being touched on there. And I would say even going further with that theory is that if you believe these things so that you can predict the future and feel safe and understand your own narrative and place in the world, you might also then begin to bring these beliefs or cognitive distortions or ways you see the world into your own identity. And so if you challenge somebody's identity, that's even going to end up having more of a fight. I read an article, I believe it was in NPR here in the States. It was I mean, it's based on a study. So I think a bunch of people wrote about it. You know how that goes. And in the news media these days, one study comes out and <laughs> there's 12 different articles saying the same thing. Um, but essentially it was saying that um, when somebody has a deep-seated belief that is almost bordering on an identity, often, you know, maybe some sort of political or scientific belief, if if a representative and this is this is done in a lab. If a representative of that field comes to them, introduces themselves, has a conversation, shows them charts and graphs and contrary evidence to their maladaptive or false belief, that person most of the time, and this was a percentage, but it was like way over 50%, will will not change their belief system. They will actually become entrenched further in the way that they believed versus the actual evidence that may have been presented to them, which shows how deep, because I I can think about, you know, if I'm wrong about something, you know, as little kids, you know, you're supposed to be telling the truth, you know, and if I'm believing a lie about myself or the world, um, I want that lie to be the truth. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, when people, most people that are not uh, psychopathic want to believe they're doing the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, there's so much shame and resistance if, if we have to admit we're wrong. But the hard part is, is that it shouldn't be the goal of conversation, right or wrong. This isn't a debate, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. It's, but it turns into a power struggle in relationships um, and these sort of things because of this, this misinterpretation. Um, also, you were talking about maybe ways to approach conversations like being mindful and you know, uh, these sort of things, uh, you know, I think the hard part is this, a lot of people use mindfulness, but they use it in the, I need to calm down. I'm really, 
upset mindfulness way, or mm -hmm. I'm going to go to yoga class and do 10 minutes of mindfulness. They aren't bringing it into their conversations yeah. as a lead up or as a prep preparatory. Uh, and so therefore I think the more stressed you are based on the physiological research, the less likely you are to have these conversations go well. Um, there's a quote from the mindfulness community, you know, the mindfulness based stress reduction, which is you are not your thoughts. But I mm -hmm. actually think that most people don't believe that in the U S and mm. I don't know about Canada, but I can't speak for Canada, but I'll just say the West. Um, <laughs> that we believe we are our thoughts, whatever we think is right. Right. Or, or yeah. that sort of thing. We're very attached to our thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, very possessive instead of the more Eastern view of, of the fact that the, which is also scientific, that the mind just babbles endlessly about the stimuli around it. And it's, um, not everything we think is true. Um, which just, it yeah. just is a natural result of having a brain. Um, yeah. So with that, um, we've delved deep into the science of that. I wanted to see um, maybe what do you think about, uh, you know, people that are trying to have better relationships through communication uh, and they're, they're trying to do better with their partner, their friend or their boss or whatever, or their teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're trying to do everything right. They're, they're, you know, they're reading your book and then things still go <laughs> south. I mean, what, what, what can we tell these people? And, and, and I know they need to read the book. I, I don't want to give away a, the whole bag here. And we're not, you know, <laughs> this is okay. not a, this is not a Ted talk. This is a, this is a podcast, but I kind of want to hear what you, you have to say to folks who are just like, you don't know my uncle, he's impossible, you know? Mm -hmm. So unfortunately that's super hard to answer because it's going to be so situationally dependent on what exactly is going on there because there's so many different things that could be happening there so maybe i'll, I'll talk about a couple popular ones maybe more common ones that could happen so there are some times where we again can be using very amazing communication skills we can be using our self-awareness and mindfulness skills. We can be using our like validation skills. We can be using like non-imposing language. We can be doing, we could stay calm. We chose a great time and place that we can have done everything by the book, by my book. <laughs> um, but yeah, sometimes people are just really, really resistant, stubborn, bullies, all sorts of things. So there's a chapter in the book of, is this relationship worth this? Like, do we have things in common anymore? Like relationships are built on your overarching common goals. And so, you know, sometimes it can be really tough with family or work where it can feel like you are kind of stuck with them, but asking yourself, are you really like, what, what are we both trying to achieve? Basically, why do we have this relationship? And sometimes going back to that can help you in, okay, well, you know, is it time to let go of this person? So that's a huge question to ask and a very difficult one. But sometimes if you're coming up against the situation where you're like, I feel like I'm working really hard, I'm doing everything right. And this person is not even taking a step to meet me halfway, that it might be time to let it go. Other things that could be happening are that yeah, that person has, the other person maybe has a lot of stuff. I'm sure they do going on. They have their own biases. They have their own perspective. They have different blocks and resistances that are coming up. And so maybe there's some work that needs to be done and they're not ready, willing, or able to do it for whatever reason, you know? Um, and so sometimes it's being patient and meeting people where they're at. And that means like adjusting your goals and expectations Otherwise, it could, again, potentially be, and these are like pretty broad things, but it could be, again, the person who thinks they're doing a really great job communicating, but maybe there's some things that they just aren't aware that are coming across in a way that they don't understand. I remember I had, I had one client, this is just, you know, bless her heart. She said, oh, I, I'm telling my partner, I'm using the I feel statements. It's like, yeah, I feel you're being a jerk. And I was like, well, that's, that's not a feeling that's you're, you're telling them that they're <laughs> being a jerk. Like they're going to come back and say, no, I'm not being a jerk. And so 
you know, sometimes it's these skills can be tough and there are a lot of nuances to communication that can be really hard to get. And we have old habits that are very hard to change. And that's why, you know, working through things with a therapist, a couples therapist or an individual therapist and letting them know, Hey, this is what I did. Like, what do you think? What's another way this could have been interpreted? Like, how could I have maybe said this differently? We can always all improve. Um, And it's going to depend on the person who's on the receiving end too. Some, you know, I could say to one of my friends, like, yeah, you're being a jerk. And they'd be like, totally, you know, I'm sorry. But so that's also going to depend, you know, on the situation is, is who we're talking to, how well they know you, how, again, how they're going to interpret things. Sometimes we can predict that like with, again, certain friends, I know that they're going to be totally fine with that and know exactly what I mean and that I'm not attacking them, that I'm kind of, that's my maybe cheeky way of saying like, oh, you hurt my feelings a little bit. But maybe there's other people who that would not fly with. And if I said, hey, you're being a jerk, they'd be like, are you kidding me? No, I'm not. Like you're being a jerk for saying that. How dare you? And so we got to kind of keep those things in mind. Um, That hopefully kind of answers the question. I know it's, it's tough when it's you don't know the exact situation, but lots of different things could be going on there. Well, I think that is um, a good approach because there's no two situations alike. So there are trends and things we've seen, but I think that was a mm-hmm. good one. Um, there was a couple of things in here because in your book, I, I'm not going to give it away, but just as a preview, okay. you have a lot of skills <laughs> and you have a lot of examples and the whole point what I liked was the summary here was stop avoiding confrontation, establish common goals, set and enforce personal boundaries, validate the other person and support yourself post-talk. So those are some things that this book will teach you, but I want to get into a little bit of a few other things that you um, talked about here, which is um, where did it go? The part about identifying and understanding your emotions without moral judgments. I thought that was Interesting. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. So this is another thing I see that that is quite popular in most everybody is I call it the, sometimes the CBT onion. And what I mean by that is we'll have a situation maybe, and then we'll have our interpretation of that situation, which will lead to a reaction. And then sometimes then we the new situation is that reaction. And then our thoughts are things like, I shouldn't be feeling that way. I should be better than that. All of these imposed shoulds. And then our new reaction is now feeling guilty, shameful, you know, self-judged, all of those. And we kind of just start piling on rather than listening to regulating if possible, you know, learning from those primary emotions from the original situation. Now we're just piling a bunch of guilt and shame on top of having an emotional reaction, which is a very valid, normal, natural thing to do, to have. So being able to kind of, again, use that self-awareness or mindfulness, whatever you want to call it. And instead of shaming ourselves, being like, oh my gosh, that shouldn't have made me angry, thinking, why did that make me angry? And going upstream from that reaction into our our automatic thoughts again of how was I interpreting that situation? What was I thinking? Again, was what I think, was what I thinking true? Um, Yeah. And then, and then kind of going from there. There's different ways to break that down, whether maybe it was true, maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't halfway kind of true. Um, so, but yeah, adding that kind of shame and judgment onto our own reactions can just cause people to feel even worse on top of feeling bad already in the first place. Yes. And I think that's a skill to be developed. And I think you know, a lot of people have to mm-hmm. read books, learn different coping skills, mindfulness meditation kind of deals with that as well. And of course, uh, individual counseling as well. Um, uh, an interesting thing here, of course, for therapists, we talk about this quite often, but, uh, what happens if somebody has either an anger outburst in a conversation 
or a crying episode where it's just we've just boiled over the top. Um, you had some some uh, tips for that. I'm just sort of curious about your analysis or maybe the tip there. Great, right. yeah. So they're quite different for each crying and anger. So maybe I'll do crying first. Uh, I I wish our society was a bit more accepting of crying. I'm a pretty um, easy crier, I would say, <laughs> in life. And sometimes you just can't help it, right? You wish you could. So there's a lot of things, again, in our kind of, yeah, Western culture that have a lot of like shame and discomfort around when people are crying. It's like, oh my gosh, immediately make them stop. Like, I feel really bad. All of these different emotions come up for people. So I kind of looked at that in the book a bit and there's a sh- just a short section about it, but basically, I mean, trying to normalize it as much as possible and depending on if you're the person crying or you're with the person that's crying. Um, again, just thinking about like what's coming up for you. Is it the urge to like immediately try and get them to stop rather than being like, you know, are you okay? Do you just want to continue on with the conversation or do you need some time? again, as the person who's crying, maybe very briefly attending to like the comfort of the other person being like, Hey, like I'm crying, you know, I'd like to just keep going through the conversation. Like I'm okay. Um, I'm just feeling really overwhelmed right now rather than, you know, their automatic thoughts might be like, I'm a terrible person. This, uh, I made this person cry. They're completely out of control emotionally now. Like they want to shut the conversation down, which could all be completely untrue. So if you're the one crying, letting the other people in on what's going on for you and like asking for what you need can be really helpful in everybody in the situation feeling a lot more comfortable. So that's one for crying. And there's a lot more I could say on it, but I think that's, that's um that one and then anger is one that and i love talking to clients about because it's such a an interesting emotion because there's always so much under it as we know as as therapists it's like more of a secondary type emotion and so i love to get clients to explore their anger and ask themselves some questions and kind of just a what is the purpose of this anger and if we look at some kind of like dialectical behavior therapy theory, thinking even just some other types of therapy theories um, about purpose of emotions, like anger. And I think I use this example in the book of if we think about like an animal that's angry, what type of response are they trying to elicit? So they're trying to elicit fear, right? They're trying to like get someone to back off basically. If you think of like an angry dog, <laughs> that's pretty, that can be pretty scary or an angry bear. Um, so if we think about that, it's like, Ooh, why, what am I trying to protect? And so anger can sometimes, most times be something that's coming out to protect a resource that we have. And that resource might be our emotions. It might be our time. It might be our physical stuff. It might be our kids. It might be who knows all sorts of things so when anger comes out yeah i say what are you trying to protect because we've kind of been desensitized to it just like you were you were speaking before about some of our our brain can't really tell the difference between the physical threat versus emotional threat i think that's very true with anger too of like we've kind of we still have these almost instinctual reactions yet being put in our society it's like if someone's angry sometimes they are actually pretty scary depending on the person but a lot of the time if it's like our partner and there's no um history of like violence or abuse it's kind of like we can just shrug it off and and be like yeah whatever like this person's yelling and angry but it doesn't really phase me like i'm not i don't have the fear response and so that's why some people just get even more and more angry when the other person isn't kind of like buying into it so for anger, that's one that I love to ask is like, what are you protecting? Is that actually, again, is this true? Is that actually being threatened right now? Are you safe? And that can really help to just deescalate anger sometimes. 
I like that because um, that leads me into further behavior discussion. You know, these are instincts, like you said, these are like reactions. And Mm -hmm. from what we've been learning a lot about the trauma responses, which is probably, which can, we can then start generalizing to other responses. Um, Humans often will have an emotional or thought response really before they've been able to completely contemplate what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's in micro nanoseconds, and then they Mm -hmm. make up a story about it. So, so if you, you know, if you go up to an animal and you raise your fist and they know what you're doing, like a dog, it will cower. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we may, or it might come at you with its teeth. I don't know. Right. But we are the same way. It's just, then we have to like talk about why that occurred and how that occurred. And we have to analyze it, but we'll have a reaction before we actually have a formalized thought. Because mm-hmm. our body and brain want to stay alive, we want to survive. So, that being said, because we've got pretty advanced brains um, and we've studied other animals uh, and primates, um, there was a there. There is this trend in psychology that say that says behind every behavior is a need. Of you know, we have a need. That's why we're doing this behavior. We have there's some reason for it, mm-hmm. right? We need something. So. If, if if that's something we can remember when we're in conversations and we're dealing with mm-hmm. people, how can how can that help us, I suppose, and maybe maybe help ourselves if we understand that maybe we're angry because we have something that's unmet, a need unmet, or we're we're we're, we're crying because something's unmet. Um, can you explain mm-hmm. a little bit about that, maybe from your perspective? So explain a little bit more about sorry, the the kind of well, when con- conflict well, when conflict when conflict comes up and there's a behavior displayed, right? There's behaviors mm-hmm. being displayed um, that may be, I don't know, divisive to conversation. How do we how do we figure out how do we not take the bait of the you know uh, as, as the person in the conversation? How do we not um, how do we be able to contextualize that somebody is needing something so that we can become a, like a, mm. a positive resolution in the conversation versus just another defender or, you know, accuser. Right. Yeah. So again, this comes back and this is, I do this so often with clients, it comes back to those goals in the conversation, I think is kind of what you're getting at where it's like, what is that motivation for the, this communication or relationship? Like sometimes it can be pretty obvious or like trivial we don't even need to think about it but when it comes to these types of conversations that i see people avoiding that they don't want to have because oh what if it escalates what if this happens like i don't know how to set boundaries i don't know how to ask this person for x y or z or explain to them how i'm feeling so thinking back to yeah what are your goals and on the flip side what are their goals and you know when those emotions can kind of come up of like oh if this person's angry ask the same question but for them what do i think they're protecting right now what is under threat for them how can i help them feel safe right using what we know about someone to and even our own experiences to like use our powers of empathy to predict what their automatic thoughts are what are what's their belief system like what, you know, when I, I go through some exercises in the book about like how to get better at this like skill of empathy that we can say, oh, I said this comment to me, it was like completely fine and a neutral comment, but they took it and are crying now and what might be going on for them. And that can just be so powerful. And what do they need? And do I need to put my conversation goals on hold now to first attend to them. And so, you know, it's, it can get these, these communication situations can get really tricky, right? And sometimes we need to digress a little bit and come back to our point later, but that's, what's great about having your own goals set out at the beginning of a difficult conversation is like, okay, even if they cry and I need to attend to them, I'm not done the conversation until I've also been able to describe my reality or come up with some solutions to like something that happened. So I can digress and attend to them, but oh yeah, I've got this reminder to to get back to what I wanted to get done. 
So I hear a lot of a, a baseline of this. I mean, there's lots of skills you can teach, but one of the biggest skills or the largest overarching skill I'm getting is sort of self-awareness and mindfulness of what you want and what you're trying to get out of it. So I think that's that's a really good point. I, I, I think in, in some leadership books uh, for business, they talk about how when you have a business meeting, you have to formalize it if you if, if between coworkers. If you don't formalize it, what happens is we often digress into family dynamic, weird conversation where everyone's just, you know, you ever seen those fake inspirational meeting pictures where they're like, together, we're worse than we were before. It, like <laughs> these like jokes about inspiration. So it's like, it can devolve into that. And so, and then well, it was in, I don't know what leadership book it was, but it was a book. It was just these two skills. I said, um, before you, when you have a meeting of three or more people or even two or more people just say, uh, say, okay, so, you know, especially about a big topic, like a, a kind of controversial topic, like, how are you feeling about this topic first? Let's like, both talk about our feelings. Okay. Now let's talk about our goals of what we, what are we going to cover in this conversation? First of all, what are, what are we going to cover? And secondly, do we have to make a decision about these? And if we're going to make a decision, how are we going to make this decision? So it's like, so, and, and when you, and I remember I recently tried that in a staff meeting with three of us and it went so well. I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. Versus if we would have just jumped in, like, what do you think about this situation? I think we would have gotten emotional responses cross wired with sort of like logic problem solving out of order. And I've had that happen before. So um, I think it's very important. Uh, you know, you mentioned that you also work in a school sometimes. It'd be great if we had a whole class on conversations and communication skills. I, I don't, I didn't have one when I was growing up. I don't know if they have them now, unless you're like in trouble. Do, do they have the prevention classes? Of I mean, I'm here. So I, I do that a little bit on one-on-one -on -one settings, but that's so funny. I was literally just talking to a, a coworker um, earlier about how we just wish this was part of the curriculum. I think I heard somewhere in Denmark, they have empathy class for people uh, in schools. And yeah, why aren't we being taught these things? I don't know. I hope it comes out in the curriculum soon. It'll probably be a while, but I hope that's where we're headed. I like to think it is because I think people are just seeing more and more that we need more social skills, especially in the age of just so much communication with like, social media, texting, emails, it's, it, yeah, things can get really misinterpreted and there can be a lot of like hard situations that people just, again, tend to avoid instead of, because they just don't feel confident they have the skills to, to handle them. Um, so that's why I, I mean, again, why I wrote the book. So hopefully that, that can do for now until we can get this content into schools. That would be great. Yeah. I've always said that every school should have um, a class either every year or every other year, which takes a semester to go over mental health. What is mental health conversation, uh, communication and relationships. And I think that we would see a decrease in school violence and uh, um, yeah. bullying and things like that, but who knows, maybe I'm just an idealist, but, uh, <laughs> but I think I was... in British Columbia, we have in health class, a uh, healthy relationship segment. So I think we've got, so again, it, there's some stuff that's really awesome. And I think we're again, headed in the right direction. That's good. Yeah. In the U S they have mindful schools, which usually mm -hmm. means that you're a rich school district and you've hired mindful schools to come in and basically, teach everyone mindfulness and communication skills, but it's not part of the actual curriculum as far as I understand in the U S um, as standard curriculum, um, not required to graduate, uh, which it should be. I think you have to pass that class. Um, so I want to know a little bit about you um, in terms of, you know, being a counselor. I was just curious, you know, uh, I don't know how long you've been a counselor, but you've already got a, a book published here. Um, how has your life kind of changed um, in your own communication from writing a book where you're now, you know, teaching everybody how to communicate. I'm just curious how that's affected you. Great question. All my communication goes perfectly now. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought. Yeah. Oh, uh, next question. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I think since, and I'm, I'm sure like every counselor has such a similar experience where going through counseling school, whatever that may be, is just 
you are your own guinea pig for so much of that time. And we have our own life experience to draw from because we don't have any clients yet. And so it's like, we're really taking a deep dive into our own selves throughout that process of just getting our, our designations or degrees or, or whatever. And so that I think just ramps up the self-awareness and we start to unpack our own beliefs and, and that's really great. Uh, so, and then being someone who then has been drawn to communication and these types of skills. Yeah. I, I apply them to my life all the time I have for years now. Uh, so my communication still, sometimes stuff comes up that, you know, in hindsight, I'm like, Oh, I could have done this differently or, Oh, you know, there's always going to be things that we can do better. But, uh, yeah, I definitely think my communication has gotten a lot better having just gone through my counseling school and then really gone through writing this book and really bringing that formal awareness to like, Oh, these are the skills I need to bring. Oh yeah. Did I maybe forget one? You know, definitely. I'm not perfect. Like, it's like, Oh, I chose a terrible time and place to bring that up. Whoops. Like gotta, gotta remember to keep that one in check next time. So definitely. Um, I think my communication has gotten better, but nowhere near perfect, but I'll keep trying. (laughs) Yeah. Right. It's, it's difficult because, you know, everybody, we have, we have so many emotions and situations that come up through our day. And I, Mm -hmm. especially when I think, uh, you're in your career and your career in in counseling, I think the career is very, uh, very uh, diverse and interesting always. Right. It's not like I'm working in a grocery store and I keep putting stuff in the bags and then occasionally somebody will, you know, do something odd. I mean, every day you you hear new stories, so that can really throw you off. You know, your game sometimes, sometimes makes your game better, but um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, the old counselor jokes, how people, uh, we'll, we'll joke like, isn't your mental health perfect? And I could just see like a, a friend of mine, if I wrote a book, just like keeping the book in their car and like, you know, being like, Hey, you screwed up chapter three right there. That's what you did. But, um, I'm just teasing, but, uh, essentially that that's really cool. So I was curious. I mean, this is just like, I feel like this book is like the beginning, you know, it seems like there's even, you know, you did, you did a deep dive, but I also feel like it seems like if you already wrote a book, you know, not to, you know, let everybody in, but are you, are you planning on writing another book? Are you, uh, do you mm. is this like your passion? Do you want to go on a speaking tour? Just sort of curious about like where you're, <laughs> where you're going with this. That's a great question. I don't really know. I kind of wrote the book because I, I wanted to help people. And I, I thought there seemed to be kind of an empty niche that needed some, some filling in that I had clients coming to me again, with the issues of avoiding difficult conversations, unsure of how to specifically set boundaries. Like they had gotten to the point where they were like, I know I need to talk about this. I know I need boundaries, but how do I actually do that? Like, what do I actually say? How do I start a conversation like that? I don't even know where to begin. So they just don't do it. And I did a ton of research and I, cause I was like, Oh, I'll just find a book and like recommend it to them, you know? And uh, or like teach them some skills that like I can learn elsewhere. And I just, I couldn't find anything. So that's where I started kind of getting these skills together. I was like, okay, they, they first need to learn this like toolkit of like 10 skills and then learn how to apply them in different orders and like, you know, different or even on their own, depending on the situation. I was like, found that this was actually being really well received by people where they were getting a lot more structure than was seems like is out there, but they were also having the freedom to adapt it to their own life situation, personal communication style, et cetera. So I was like, okay, this seems to be going well. I can't find anywhere else that's doing this. So that that's why I wrote the book. And I was like, however much I, it's, I think $21 Canadian. I think it's like $17 us. I was like, that's, you know, and it takes about three hours to read. So I think you're getting some good money's worth. I mean, my hourly rate is a lot more than that. Um, so yeah, I was like, this this is a great way to hopefully reach some people, save some people some money. And uh, yeah, give some of these tools out into the world. So in no way was I like, oh, I want to write a book. What should I write about? I was just like, I think this could be helpful 
people. And then, so I had, my only expectation was to like do a fun project, see what it's like to put out a book. I thought that would be neat. I like taking on new challenges and hobbies. So I was like, this will be really fun. It was, I learned a whole ton of cool things about like the publishing industry. And now, as far as expectations for future books, I have a couple ideas floating around and I'm squirreling away some, some little like things that again, I've found helpful for clients or that I've just, you know, bits of research and things I, or techniques that I find helpful and interesting. Um, but nothing super solid in the works yet, as far as another book and a tour. I'm not sure. I've I've done some publicity. Uh, you can check it out on my website, theconversationguide.com slash publicity. I've um, that's I think probably about as close to a book tour as I have time for right now because I'm quite busy. Uh, but yeah, I love to do you know little speaking things here and there when I can. Yeah, very cool. I appreciate you telling us about your process a little bit about uh, how how it came about. Um, I was actually thinking about this too when I was looking at your book because I've. Uh, when clients come in with these concerns, it's like, well, you got to learn boundaries. So here's a giant book on boundaries. Here's like, and here's a book on, here's a 300, 500 page book on codependence. Okay. Okay. So now after you get that done, then you need to read, um, like, uh, some behavioral book. And then, and then I found a new book called, uh, a mindful guide to nonviolent communication. Cause the original nonviolent communication guide is like 500 pages. It's huge. Um, mm-hmm. so, but even in that guide, uh, he's got, you know, it's a really good book, but he, it's more like a philosophical approach, Theory. a little bit less yeah. on the, uh, practical side. So I, I like what you said, structure. Yeah. I think this is like a structural totally. guide that's practical and uh, uh, applicable, yeah. which is really Thank cool you. because I think in this day and age, yeah, you're welcome. I, in this day and age, I think, um, the luxury of having time is something at least in the U S has been is a luxury now. Um, and I've seen it within my lifetime, um, for various reasons we won't go into because this podcast isn't about time. Uh, it has time has seemed to change the way people spend their time. And so having these long books on boundaries and philosophical approaches to communication are really Mm -hmm. cool. But I think, aren't as accessible for, you know, people that may not have a lot of money or time. Well, time is money, according to my economics professor back in college, yeah. and he was right. <laughs> um, and so, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, this book, you know, is a quick read uh, and yet kind of a reference guide. So, um, exactly. cause it's got all the skills in there. So um, I'm definitely going to recommend this book and I'm going to have all the links in the show notes. Um, Thank you. I, yeah, absolutely. I guess I was, I wanted to, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I, I might be about Go like, you know, what about people that have just lost hope? They're like, I suck at communicating. I'm the worst. I, you know, I know these are cognitive distortions, but I've heard this before. It's like, I'll never be able to, mm-hmm. you know, talk to uh, people this way. I always, I always, you see another one. I always, you know, yeah. react this way. Like it, I've got advice for them if you don't, but, but what are some advice you give for somebody that's just like, they clicked on this episode cause they heard about, you know, communication and how to, mm-hmm. and they thought maybe mm-hmm. I listen to this podcast and I'll be ready to, you know, maybe that'll help me. But, uh, you know, I'm saying read the book, but what would you say kind of to give people hope that they can like learn these skills? I mean, I've seen so many people learn these skills. I think anyone can do it. That might not be helpful to them because they probably think they're the exception and that no, they can't. And so I think that again, in a situation like that, there's probably some things to unpack on an individual level about like why that person wants to stay stuck. There's some secondary gains there of, you know, well, I don't have to put the effort into doing this or I don't have to try and then fail. I can just admit I'm a failure and then go on with things. So I think there might be some some stuff to potentially on the client if they're ready to to challenge that. Um, but if that again is their belief system, they're probably going to protect that pretty fiercely. And so coming up around like, okay, well, you know, what kind of person again? A very CBT question. What kind of person does that make you if you're someone who fails at communication all the time? Like, are you a bad person? Does this like again play into some sort of like negative belief they have about themselves? So. 
again, it would really depend on the individual. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really answer it too much, but I think, yeah, I'd probably start there. I think that's a good start. And, um, and if people, you know, want, they can, they can check out the book and start learning some skills. And if they find it too difficult, they can just re-gift it to somebody for a holiday or something like that, because it wasn't too big of an investment. So that's my yeah. advice on that. Um, and, you know, just like anything we try, um, it's always more difficult at the beginning. And that is mm -hmm. scientifically validated, you know, with exercise and learning math and, you know, um, you know, yep. uh, you, you know, our parents learning how to use a computer and things like that, you know, it's scientifically proven. It, it's more difficult to, at the beginning. So, um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's a fair, a fair shake. Like I said, I've got all that information there in the show notes for everybody. And, uh, you know, I'm just curious, um, do you ever, you know, have a little dialogue with your readership? Curious about that. Definitely. I love getting emails. Anyone who picks up a copy of the book, uh, they can find, there's a contact form on my website, www.theconversationguide.com. And you can email me, ask me questions about the book. Uh, I have clients who have already read the book and love talking to me about it and asking me questions, which is great. I'm part of a book club that we're actually reading it this month. So I can't wait to hear what their feedback is. So definitely I've, I'm open to any and all questions, um, praise, criticisms, whatever, whatever you got. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from people. Well, that's exciting. And people can also connect to you on your Instagram, which they can click on. Uh, well, Joelle, it's been wonderful having you on here. And I'm so glad that you have contributed this book to uh, the general public. And uh, yes, I'm just en enjoying it so far. So I, I, I can possibly send you some feedback when I finish it. So... Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me and picking up a copy of the book and hopefully in the future, giving me some feedback about it and maybe we, we can talk about it again. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Joelle. there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. As you may have known, I have released a video course for parents of young adults, What Should We Do Now? It is available on Udemy, which is a course website. The link will be in the show notes. If you are looking for an EMDR, International Association Consultant, I am now an Emdria Consultant, and I can provide all of the 20 hours needed to become Emdria certified. I have current Emdria consultation groups going on online and some individual appointments in person. Check out the link in the show notes for details. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids area at Health for Life Grand Rapids and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting healthforlifegr.com. That's healthforlifegr.com. And thanks to telehealth, if you are in the state of Michigan, you can see the counselors online as well. If you are looking to be trained in EMDR therapy and have never even gone through the original training, I recommend EMDR Training Solutions. The links are in the show notes, and if you use the code INTENTIONAL, you will get $100 off your first training. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon the literature they have read in their experience in their respective fields, Whatever is said on this podcast should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on this or any other subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. 
If you're in crisis, please dial 911 right now or the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. Are you a young person of color feeling down, stressed out, or overwhelmed? Text the word STEVE, that's S-T-E-V-E, to 741741, that's 741741, and a live, trained crisis counselor will respond. Did you know that you could support your local bookstore by shopping at bookshop.org? That's right, you can order online from the comfort of your home while knowing that your purchase will go to supporting local bookstores, independently owned ones near you. If you are a therapist and you are not a member of your professional association, I highly recommend that you get involved. It's only a couple hundred dollars a year for the dues, which help pay for the legal costs and other trainings that us therapists need to make sure that our profession is continued to be respected and available to the public. For instance, the Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association is a great organization that I highly recommend in Michigan and the Arizona Counselors Association in Arizona. Until next time, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week.